Welcome to another CNBC Africa Space Show. My name is Julius Bismungu. Today we speak to the Rwanda's ICT and Innovation Minister, you know, on Rwanda's innovation agenda and how the country wants to become an innovation hub. Uh, Minister, thank you so much for accepting to speak to CNBC Africa. Thank you. Uh, for nearly three decades now, Rwanda has place a very heavy focus on you know ICT and innovation as key drivers you know into a knowledge based economy uh, the country wants to become a regional uh, innovation hub and perhaps among key among you know uh, that is the recent launch of the Kigali innovation city uh, but before we go there let's look at 2021 uh, we've seen covid-19 really acc accelerating uh, you know, adoption of ICT and innovation. What really characterized the year uh, in that space here? Thank you. And, and maybe just to start off from really COVID-19, because what we've been doing as a country, as a government, is leveraging different resources, including digital technologies, in our response uh, towards COVID-19. And so all the way from the different tools that have been used, whether it's in tracking and tracing uh, people that have tested positive, but also following up on them and monitoring that uh, at the same time even using some uh, you know ai models to sort of um, uh, be able to analyze what the trend of the spread of covid 19 is and what measures can be put in place are some of the tools that we put at disposal but we've also seen examples where we're using robots for example starting with the treatment centers but also at the airports where we are minimizing as much as possible uh, contact for uh, for the health workers but at the same time when you look at spaces like the airports or public places whether it's markets it's also to uh, relieve the burden of having for example to test some of the vitals like uh, you know body screening temperature screening and being able to have tools that can help you do that mass testing or mass assessment uh, in the shortest time possible but also 2021 has been an interesting year uh, for us as a government or as a country uh, we've seen growth uh, in terms of digital adoption in many uh, uh, spaces, starting even with the financial sector, where there's been tremendous growth when it comes to digital payments, but also adoption of different e-commerce platforms. Um, just in 2021, we had about uh, you know, uh, close to 100 merchants that were onboarded on different e-commerce platforms. You see digital payments growing uh, tenfold, mm -hmm. but at the same time, the appetite to use different uh, digital payment channels, whether it's mobile money or cards, uh, to really transact across the board. And, and it's such gains that obviously going forward, we need to be able to capitalize on that, but also sustain them so that we're not going back to w what, what it was before. Uh, but also, what we are seeing, even just looking at the policy and regulatory landscape, is um, 2021 was a year where we were able to uh, initiate and, ha and, and go through the entire process of enacting the data protection and privacy law. A very key policy when it comes to uh, this day and age where um, a lot of uh, personal data or data in general is being used uh, to deliver new business models um, to, to really inform some of the decisions that we are making and so when it really also borders on personal data, then there has to be mechanisms through which we can adequately protect the collection and processing of that personal data. And you may ask what was there before we had such a law. Obviously, we had certain instruments in place, uh, whether it's through the ICT law or even the cybersecurity law, but weren't sufficient given how much we are now leveraging data uh, to inform the different decisions, to inform implementation, to inform uh, new businesses that, um, uh, that are grooming uh, we've also been able to negotiate, um, which, which really now takes us into going forward. What happens? We've been able to negotiate with the World Bank and the Asian Infrastructure uh, Investment Bank to really put in place a $200 million fund that is going to be focused on uh, scaling uh, digital infrastructure, looking at last mile connectivity solutions, that's going to be looking at capacity building all the way from digital literacy, but also uh, high-end uh, tech skills that are required uh, to build the ecosystem. Um, the fund will also focus on how do we digitize the different services, how do we build data-driven models for different sectors. There's going to be a huge focus of that financing that is going to go into the health sector as we think about building uh, electronic uh, medical records for citizens, but also building the different uh, health platforms that are needed to deliver uh, quality health care uh, to our citizens. But most importantly, we're also going, a key challenge that we are facing today is the adoption, because what you see 
obviously is um, you know uh, penetration or coverage where we have over 93 percent 3g coverage over 97 percent 4g coverage but that doesn't really translate into actual statistics of how many people can use or benefit from it in a meaningful way and so the statistics are much lower but it's also a question of affordability a question of uh, you know affordability of devices and services and so a, a big chunk of that fund is going to be used uh, to create financing models that allow us to be able to uh, provide, um, you know, financing models for uh, device ownership. Um, uh, perhaps before we leave that, you know, what explains the fact that, especially when you talk about digital infrastructure, what explains the fact that you've seen companies, uh, you know, that are selling, for instance, 4G, uh, you know, the infrastructure is there, uh, but still, you know, this business come and go, come and go, you know, out of business. What is the missing link? So there's companies, so I think there are two things. There's companies that are selling 4G, whether it's the ISPs or telecoms, those are still there. Uh, they're still selling those services. And I'll come back to that because affordability is still a key challenge for most of our people who, yes, they understand and appreciate the, how fast 4G is, but if it's still not affordable and expensive, then you just have a small percentage, maybe 9% uh, that, that are able to afford, uh, you know, these services. But beyond the infrastructure which is 4G that has been put in place it also has to come with use cases obviously when you look at 5G and 4G you're looking at smart city uh, applications you know streaming uh, type of applications and so that's another segment uh, of, of the value chain that we really need to unlock which is really around content developing sorry content development where we need to support different uh, content developers to build the right content that makes it attractive for um, uh, you know, citizens to, to use uh, these services, including 4G. Uh, because the absence of that, then if 3G can, uh, can, can do what you really are yeah. going to use the internet for, then you may not see the value of shifting to 4G. So it also comes with the different use case applications that need to be put in place. And it also brings me to, uh, which is a good question that you raise, uh, w when we think about use case applications, obviously we're not just looking at smart cities, you're looking at things, uh, for example, in the education sector. We started off this conversation talking about the disruption that COVID-19 has been. Uh, and the biggest disruption obviously has been in the education um, you know, uh, sector, where you know, beyond the school closures that have happened, I mean, the amount of learning losses that has occurred, and this is really not unique to Rwanda, it's something that you'll find globally. But what we see is a trend of blended learning models where there's a mix of both you know, the traditional ways of learning, but also adopting different um, you know, digital learning uh, options that could be available to students. And with that, in 2021, we, uh, uh, we kicked off an initiative called GIGA. It's a global initiative. Rwanda is one of the flagship countries that have been chosen. It's about school connectivity, but we were able to push beyond just focusing on connectivity because we've learned from the last 15 years that if we just focus on infrastructure, then there are the other levers that need to be unlocked for us to see adoption happening. So we've piloted in Bujesera. We've taken 63 schools in Bujesera district. And we're deploying um, school connectivity infrastructure, training teachers on digital literacy, but also how to use some of these tools, uh, digitizing their content, but at the same time also providing digital literacy training for, for, for the students and teachers as well. Uh, do you think there's so much that the government can do about affordability? Because, uh, because this is a very you know, key challenge to everyone who wants to use 4G. And uh, perhaps I'll also ask about is it right to think about to start thinking about uh, adoption of 5G? You know where we've seen in South Africa, for instance. You know companies are starting to pilot that. Is it really right to think about that uh, adopting that in a, a presence of you know even 4G is not is not working for people? Yes, the answer is yes. We we are already thinking about 5G. Uh, in fact, um, uh, towards the end of last year, a roadmap was developed on how we can start to roll out uh, 5G, really looking at the spectrum that needs to be availed for that to happen, but also looking at the players that are going to be, uh, you know, that will be drivers of really ro rolling out this uh, 5G. Now, uh, and, and obviously to your point, many countries are already adopting 5G and there's no reason why Rwanda should be left behind. And part of the roadmap is to see how can we fast track it so that at least we are also ahead because very soon we're also going to be talking about 6G. So instead of playing catch up, how do we unlock the broadband market in such a way that we are also uh, at the forefront of some of these emerging technologies. The second part of your question, which is really around affordability, again, 
affordability is not unique to just 4G. Um, uh, even as we were talking about devices, uh, w when you look at the smartphone penetration uh, rate in Rwanda, it's about 21%. So obviously when you look at mobile penetration, it's over 80%, but only 20% are using smartphones. Um, and, and again, it comes back to the question of affordability because today anyone that wants to buy a smartphone in our market would have to make an upfront, uh, you know, full payment for that smartphone. So they're still quite expensive, but what you see in most other countries is that there, there are a couple of things. They're able to uh, put in place device financing mechanisms, whether it's with the telecommunication operators who have a way of uh, you know, uh, creating financing models for the devices, but also for some of the retail companies. So as I mentioned, the financing that we've just secured with the World Bank and AIIB is focused on unlocking these different uh, financing models because we believe one size fits all won't work now. We are lucky as Rwanda that um, we already have categorized um, you know, households according to income level, and that is going to be a key design factor in what financing models will work for, let's say, with the category one versus with the category four, because ultimately what we want is to make sure that everyone can afford a smartphone, and in turn that will also drive digital literacy, because these are two things that go hand in hand. Mm. Uh, away from that fund, we also saw last year the Rwanda Innovation Fund, uh, you know, being launched. And just the other day, uh, this company made, I think, the second investment into uh, Max, a startup. Uh, this, this was the first government-backed venture capital uh, fund. What was the government's thought process behind that? As a starting point, innovation and, and ICT are central to the government agenda um, in terms of how do we leapfrog these different development stages. Um, as we, over time, started to look at what are the challenges that the industry has, because obviously there's investments that government has put in place over time, from the time we started deploying um, you know, fiber optic cable as a backbone to connect uh, and also to support with the last mile connectivity. But on the second, uh, on, on the flip side, what we have to also be looking at is how do we build an industry? Because if you want to be a technology hub, an innovation hub, it cannot just be sustained by government investments alone. Neither can it also be sustained by private sector investments alone. So it's really finding those complementarities that both the government and private sector will invest and, and then create that kind of um, you know, positioning for an economy. So the Rwanda Innovation Fund was born from the fact that a lot, the biggest challenge that most of our tech companies were facing was financing. Uh, most of the financial institutions that we had in the country back then were more focused on traditional uh, financing models. And when you look at the, our demographics, we had most of the tech startups are largely you know, owned by youth. Many of them don't have any collateral to put to a bank. They have just a brilliant idea to solve you know, a, a challenge that we have within the economy. And so to, to, to take to a bank an idea and expect to get financing was really uh, seemingly very uh, difficult for most of our startups. And so uh, even borrowing from other best practices, it, it was natural that as a government we, we should start to think about how we build a venture uh, capital industry that can then support some of these innovative ideas. And so the starting point was to you know, create a joint fund um, and find some fund managers that could also you know, pull in some of their resources and be able to finance this. And so this is going to be the beginning of many. Obviously, when you think about innovation, there's different financing. What you've just um, you know, talked about, which is the Rwanda Innovation Fund, is really uh, focused on growth stages. A company has already ideated, they've already done a prototype, they probably already have a client in place, but they need some money to scale their product or services. But before we reach that stage, we have to build a pipeline of startups that can benefit from it. And so that's why, whether it's through the National Council for Science and Technology, there's the uh, Research and Innovation Fund, which is critical because if you want to build transformative innovations, then there has to be a huge component of research and development happening. Then going forward, we look at the Startup Fund, which is something that we've also established here in the Ministry of ICT and Innovation, because the, both the, the Research and Innovation Fund and the Startup Fund will create a good pipeline of startups and businesses that can benefit from the Rwanda Innovation Fund.
And then another thing, let's talk about the recent inauguration of uh, the Kigali Innovation City, you know, very popular. Now everybody's talking about it. Uh, and it's, it's been in the process, you know, for quite some time now. Uh, when you look at the things you've achieved with that project, how can you describe where you are at the moment and how significant do you think this is for a country like Rwanda that aspires to become uh, a knowledge-based economy? Mm -hmm. yeah. You're very right. Kigali Innovation City has been in the making for quite a while. It started off as um, uh, Technopole. I think that, that was the very first name that we gave it about more than eight years ago. And obviously at that point what we were looking at was how do we create a hub that can allow us to you know, build synergies between uh, local and uh, multinational technology uh, businesses. Uh, but over time, uh, what has happened really has been a question of really, um, you know, designing and understanding how do we position Rwanda better, because just next door in Kenya, you have Konza City. Uh, when you go to other parts, South Africa has about two of those, and so uh, in total you have more than, you know, 13 across the continent. So ideally what that meant for us was really trying to figure out what is going to be our competitive advantage, but also knowing that what would be needed was uh, a strong collaboration happening around uh, all these uh, innovation cities or hubs that are being created. So where we are at today, uh, to your point, is really a significant milestone because today Kigali Innovation City has transitioned from what we call the pre-development phase, which was largely around the planning, like I've just mentioned, and planning which also included, uh, you know, putting in place a, a clear master plan and detailed designs of what the city would look like eventually, uh, figuring out what uh, the mix of the ecosystem would look like. It's going to be a mixed-use uh, facility, so it's not just office spaces. You have universities that are already established there today. Then you have accommodation facilities, hotels, and all these other amenities that are critical to, to really striking a work-live balance that is really needed within uh, such a space. So that's where we are transitioning now from, from this pre-development, which has agreed to finance this basic infrastructure, looking at all utilities, telecommunication, water, electricity, sewage, and everything, and roads. But then we're also going to put in place a visitor center, as well as the first, uh, what we call, office building, that will have office spaces and incubation hubs for the different innovators. So this is what we are moving into right now, now that the master plan has already been done. But the master plan includes more than that, including also the museum as well. And so with all these facilities, whether it's the apartments, whether it's the, you know, the, the universities, the office spaces, because you could have one particular company that wants to construct a building for themselves. And this is the work that we're going to do together with Africa 50 to go out and find people who can fund uh, and, and, and use the space that we're, we're, we're putting out. Your second part of the question, which is focused on, you know, how does it fit in the, you know, overall uh, agenda for Rwanda of becoming a knowledge-based economy. I think the starting point is really also understanding that to be a knowledge-based economy, you need to put some of the foundations in place, like KIC, which is really building a strong foundation for education and research. And we're already seeing this KIC being one of the you know, anchors through which we can deliver this, being the universities that have already been set up there, like uh, Carnegie Mellon Africa Campus, the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, the University of Rwanda is setting up their biomedical engineering uh, center there, then you also have ALU. So even already thinking about it from a, you know, from a skills and human capital development angle, because that's what really fuels the knowledge-based economy, KIC becomes a strong um, you know, uh, anchor for that. Obviously beyond uh, now the, the, the human capital development aspect then comes the fact that we want to create those synergies and collaboration, being able uh, to attract the right financing that will help some of these startups to, to, to scale. And the final bit is, as Rwanda positioned itself to be a, a knowledge hub, part of having Kigali Innovation Cities that we can also become a proof of concept hub. And by that we mean we want to be a place, uh, we want Rwanda to be known as a place where innovators across the world, across Africa can come as part of attracting the best talent and innovate and create you know, solutions to African problems. Once it works here in Rwanda, then we can already think about scaling it to the rest of the continent. And so that's what our value proposition, our competitive advantage is here to be a proof of concept hub. Mm. Uh, one of the things I want us to touch on is, uh, I remember you making a presentation, I, I think, or some time back, regarding, uh, you know, read our reading capacity, you know, uh, in schools, uh, writing, way below the average, the global average. And we're thinking about attracting investors in something like the KIC. 
uh, and investors are always going to where talent is. And the biggest question now is what is the government's strategy towards, you know, uh, retention, um, I, mean, I mean, talent retention, you know, for instance, how do you make sure that you really have the right foundation uh, for, for all the things that you're trying to build? Mm. I think a starting point before we go to retention is attraction and, and even building those skills. Um, and you go back to, to some of the fundamentals of that. And, and if we, even with Rwanda's current uh, competence-based curriculum, um, we have confidence that at least we're going to start building now the much needed talent that can be a good match for what the industry is looking for. Obviously by inviting some of these uh, world-class institutions like CMU and AIMS, the idea is how do we bring uh, you know, the capacity to build such skills but also to attract uh, some of the best brains across the continent to come and benefit from such world-class education that we provide here. And, and that is one. But now coming to the retention bit, which is also always the harder one, is you've attracted them here, you've given them the best education, whether it's Rwandans and, and, and non-Rwandans, how then do they stay in the market, in the, in the country, so that they can create value, that they can translate the knowledge that you've given them into business opportunities and, solve, and, and a way of solving problems. So some of the things that we're doing are around immigration um, uh, policies, uh, around retention, which I think you've already seen some countries that have started with a digital nomad visa, where you have, this is a, you know, a great incentive to attract some of the best talent globally to come and really um, establish themselves here. Obviously when they come, you, you already have some of these opportunities to tie them to. So that's one of the things that we're already, cons uh, you know, we're already uh, you know, developing to say how do we create a digital nomad visa that makes it easy not just to attract but to retain some of the best talent here. The second thing is some of the efforts, even whether it's through the investment promotion efforts that are happening or, be, or, or the development of startups here, because once you, you have this talent that has been built or has, that has been attracted, they must be connected to opportunities. Is it the multinationals that we are inviting in Rwanda to set up their headquarters here and set up some form of operations, even if it's not a headquarter, but it's their research and development operations, then you've already created an opportunity that needs to be met by the talent that is already there. And we saw it in the very first two years where some of the talent that was being groomed here was naturally gravitating towards uh, you know, countries that had already attracted some of these you know, big tech uh, companies. And so that's the strategy we have in place, not just to build our startup ecosystem, but also to attract some of these uh, leading technology companies on the continent, but also uh, globally. Um, another aspect, obviously, to retain, because most of them may not just be looking for a job, but may be looking to build a business. I come in, I'm a student, let's say from Ghana or Nigeria, I get education through CMU, I want to build a startup. What do we have in place that makes it attractive for them to feel uh, they want to stay in Rwanda and, and, and build their startup rather than find another, you, you know, another place? And so that is under our Startup Act that has already been in development and should be um, as well enacted this year. The Startup Act provides a list of incentives for startups, uh, also really looking at the, some of the pain points they have as they go through their startup growth which is really around tax incentives that they get, capacity building programs that they can benefit from, some financing that they are able to also get, intellectual property advisory uh, or facilitation that they can get. So all of this has been put under our Startup Act, making it um, an attractive tool uh, that allows us to retain some of the talent that we've been able to attract here. S still talking about startups, uh, because we've seen on average, a startup is going to die in the next Three to five years, uh, you know, uh, oh, you know, of establishment, and the concern has been always that we don't allow uh, startups to fail. Let's say, like in Israel, where you know start startups are given more chances to try and fail, try and fail. How do we change the mindset around that? And, and maybe should we say we don't allow or they don't allow themselves? I think it's both ways. Um, and and, and it, it has, it's not something that you unlock overnight. It's work in progress. So why do I say that? Um, again, what you're building is not a startup to build a particular solution. If it doesn't work, then the startup dies. But it's building a capacity to iterate and figure out something else that they can do. Um, I like that you mentioned Israel, which is a good example, especially when you're talking about you know, building a startup ecosystem, and that's why they get the name of the startup nation. 
Um, what you see in Israel, obviously, is the you know is the risk taking culture that yeah. these startups already have. They're they're willing to you know throw resources at, at any problem it will work it may not work but at least let's keep moving if it doesn't work i'll figure out another challenge we didn't so have that luxury I th we need to create it I, I think we need to create it and and how do we create it and and that will bring me back to a couple of initiatives beyond just the uh, the startup fund or whatever it is is even when you're solving for a problem i, I mean we've we've heard that sometimes you sponsor or support a thousand startups and maybe only 10 will make it but the value that the 10 create in the economy outpasses what you've already invested in about 1000 so i think it's being open uh to to knowing that some will work others will not but also trying to figure out why did they not work the other thing that you see in israel which is something that we really are going to have to work on with our startups and work together is majority of them don't build startups to become established businesses they, they already create them with an exit strategy in mind to say, I'm building a solution that I think Microsoft needs and I'll make sure I sell it to them and it's a good product for them. And Microsoft will buy it, you know, do whatever they have to do with it and then put it on the market. So, and, and that's where we need to get. Uh, and again, like I said, it's really work in progress. It's that risk taking culture that has to happen where people will be comfortable if I support 100 startups and only one of them makes it, then the other 99 have learned something which they will take on to build another startup. And someone can even build four startups before they, the fifth can actually survive. And we need to be comfortable with that and, and, and not feel like failing is a problem exactly, but rather it's a good thing to know and what am I learning from every failure that will make me better in the next startup that I build. So to your point, um, it, it doesn't exist yet here. But I think it's something, it's something that we are all aware as policymakers, as government, even the industry in itself. And it's, we're going to have to take the baby steps that are necessary to create that, uh, that culture. That was Rwanda's ICT and Innovation Minister Paula Ingabile speaking on Rwanda's innovation agenda. It seems the country is really back and is really setting a very ambitious target of becoming an innovation hub here in the region. Thank you very much for watching.